This is a production of Cornell University. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here. And I want to thank the Zelaznicks, uh, Barbara and David Zelaznik, who are funding our reading series and doing such a great thing for our program and the community. So today, it's my honor to introduce Lisa Russ Spar a poet whose work in the tradition of Emily Dickinson is a gift to the language. Spar is professor of English at University of Virginia, and she also served for 11 years as director of their outstanding writing program. Through it all, she somehow managed to work in three demanding capacities. She's poet, critic, and editor. She's received a Guggenheim Fellowship for her poetry, among other honors, and her work has appeared in Poetry, Boston Review, Yale Review, Harvard Review, Best American Poetry Series, and many other journals and anthologies. In addition to being one of the finest poets writing today, Lisa is also one of a very few who have taken on the formidable task of writing about poetry. Her essays on poetry are inventive, generous, intelligent, and deeply informed. Her critical writing has appeared regularly in the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Washington Post, New York Times Book Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and many other venues. She was shortlisted for the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award for Excellence in Reviewing, and I can think of no one more deserving of that honor. Now I'm actually going to talk about her poetry, which is such a pleasure for me. Um, I'll talk for maybe, I don't know, five minutes, six minutes. One of the higher functions of poetry, perhaps the highest, is to call the reader back to experience the poem again and again. Spar is the quintessential lyric poet who reinvigorates the classic lyric subjects, nature, love, desire, mortality, spirituality, time, through the brilliance of her language and thinking. Her poems pose the largest questions and sometimes even answer them. But my point is, repeated readings never diminish or deplete Spar's work. Her poems continue to reverberate freshly, allowing the reader to see more, feel more, understand more with each reading. This resonance or depth reminds me of a quality called umami in cooking. As you might know, in addition to the five basic tastes, which are sweet, sour, bitter, or salty, there's now this sixth thing that's been proved by science, umami. It's the property that gives certain foods, such as ripe brie or shiitake mushrooms, chocolate, coffee, uh, it gives it a lingering richness on the palate. In addition to all the other qualities that one expects from poetry, Spar's work has this quality of umami. It is brothy, fleshy, tangible, tactile, and deliciously slant or oblique. Like the greatest lyric poetry, it is irreducible, unparaphrasable, or as she writes, unrelayable as the choked perimeter of a prayer. The titles of Spar's poetry books hint at her Dickinsonian affinities. Glass Town, Blue Venus, Satin Cash, which is a phrase from Dickinson, Vanitas Ruff, and her latest volume, Orexia. Orexia means appetite, hunger, and we most often hear it prefixed by an, anorexia. Spar's Orexia opens with the lyric forceps of wishbone, the bone from a bird's body that is literally torn by human appetite and desire. There's self-reflexive questioning as Spar speaks to both the darkness of remorse and the light of creativity. Loosely thematic recurring threads shimmer throughout the book, spellbinding the collection with a continuity that constantly widens. There are poems called Owl Hour, Oh, a series with hour in, in the title, Baroque hour, Friday night hour, 
and they create a temporal thread. Then there are three poems called Celibacy that reflect on solitude as much as sexuality. Going alone with song for company. Or the company of fellow travelers, such as John Clare or Dorothy Wordsworth. And there's a weave of temple poems, temple godite, temple solstice, temple moon, and more. And those poems create contemplative spaces. Temples, after all, are both holy sites and anatomical sites, part of our heads, our skulls. Spar's temple often is the body, and her poems sometimes serve as shrines of transubstantiation converting the mundane to the transcendent. The temples hold the joys and the anguish of consciousness, including the cerebral acts of writing and reading. There's a great deal of spontaneity, as well as control, in this work. The poem's trajectories and inclusions are refreshingly unpredictable, yet utterly right. They're surprising, and that's a trait that I cherish in poetry in a nuanced, original observation of feeling, Spar notes that it is impossible to will surprise, that particular other invading the inside. Finally, there's nothing facile in this book. Instead, there is mutiny, accident, registers and rhetorics both lofty and low. Is love the start of a journey back? If so, back where? And make it holy, Spar commands. But in Celibacy One, the tone changes to something more acerbic. Fuck the heart. On the radio driving home, I learned the Brits are into all things Scandinavian. Sunlit schools, bare breasts, the aurora borealis, a Scandi trance. So you can see the tone, how that she has the ability to do so many things. I'll end by saying that of all poets writing today, I think Lisa Russ Spar is the one most closely allied with Dickinson, the one who carries the Dickinsonian tradition into this century. Like her great progenitor, Spar writes the language of infinity, which has no native tongue. So lyric poets must invent one, a native tongue found only in their poetry. Like Dickinson, Spar is wife of eternity. That's not Dickinson I'm quoting, it's Spar. Wife of eternity, inventing O'Clock's pendulum, the endlessly unsolvable sum. Even in windowless rooms, I see the sky. Actually, I'm gonna say that again because I misquoted. Even in windowless rooms, I see sky, Spar writes. And that's the effect her poems have. They open sublime vistas, a cosmos in the mind. So Alice got me she, yeah, with that. Uh, thank you, Alice, very much. I'm, I'm OK, though. I really am. <laughs> thank you so much for having me um, here. I, uh, Dickinson has a, has a poem, There Came a Day at Summer's Full, you know, just for me. And I, I, I feel like today is such a day. And uh, the weather, and thank you for coming in from that beautiful day to be in this room with with all, of, with all of us. Some thanks especially to Alice for inviting me um, and Hank for his good company, Lynn for keeping the trains running on time, Elena for the invitation in the first place, and uh, Michael Pryor, who was the most elegant um, and, uh, and charming guy that I could have had today, and all of the English department, and then this Barbara and David, is that right? <laughs> Zelaznik. Uh, in case you're listening somewhere, uh, thank you very much uh, for supporting poetry. So, Unami, I love that. Um, I have a son who's a chef, and I'm gonna can't wait to share that with him. 
Um, I, I wanted to just begin, um, first of all, um, Alice set the book up so well, so many of the things I often have to say about it have already, uh, she's already mentioned about the temple series and the hours. I'm so grateful for that. And, you know, it's such a joy to be seen as a person um, in a, by a lover or a friend and as a poet. And I just feel like I was, and so I feel a little naked or nude, depending on how you think about that. We talked about that this morning in, in a group of graduate students. But anyway, um, I just wanted to uh, say that about two weeks ago at UVA, I took part on a panel of arts fellows, um, and it was a, we had to do something to sort of show the deans that we that the arts fellows had accomplished something. So we um, we decided we would have a little talk, and we were trying to think of a title that would lure students in. And so um, we I came up with art and the F word, thinking that that might you know uh, draw students in, and that we would we would surprise them by talking about failure. Art and failure, art and fame, art and futility, you know, other kinds of F words. But um, I decided that I sh probably should talk about the F word and did. And I'm, since I, this may be recorded and I'm not sure <laughs> whether I'm allowed to say it because I know that I won't say it. But one thing that I talked about was how happy I am that in English, in the English language, which is the language I know best, that if I wanted to say the F word, I have a whole at my disposal this whole arsenal of other words I might say, and here are a few of them. I think these are okay. Bonk, some of them are very dated. Lay, screw, ball, shag, bang, copulate, mate, hook up, no, as in the biblical sense, Roger, which is I think an 18th century term, um, make love, make the beast with two backs, and so on. I looked at on the Max Planck Institute's World Loanword Database, which exists, and English has the most loan words in it. We um, we take into our language more words than any other any other country, and we have no um, no there's no board sort of determining what kinds of words we allow in and out. And um, I like I love that, although you know there are extremes of nationalism and usurpation and marginalization sometimes account for these words coming in. So it's not all, you know, share and share alike. But I'm excited about that. And, and even last year when the Oxford English Dictionaries didn't even name a word as its word of the year, it was the, an emoji, uh, which is the one laughing and crying at the same time. So that was good. But anyway, so for this panel, and I just thought I would share this with you, I decided to look at the seven languages from the seven banned countries, the original seven banned countries, Trump banned countries, so Iraq, Iran, Syria, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, and Libya, and just made a, a short list of some of the words that are really important to me that I use a lot. From the Arabic, satin, candy, chemistry, alchemy, coffee, Admiral, algebra, almanac, mattress. From the Persian, caviar, chess, jasmine, julep, kiosk, magic, pajama, paradise, shawl. And from the Turkic, kaftan, I don't use that a lot, but I like being able to say it, mammoth, quiver, and yogurt. So I, so I just thought I would start uh, off reading one of the temple poems, and just for fun, I kind of went through it and just got some of the etymology. So this is one short little poem. Um, two, four, six, eight, ten. Yes, it's a little sonnet haunted poem. It contains uh, a lot of German words. Um, so among those are, um, well, I'll get to them, but sateen is from the Arabic. The word loss is Old Norse, flush from the Middle English, arm from Dutch, from the German mouth, sill, wilt, and thank, from the Old English sleeve, from the Sanskrit summer, from the Old French doctor, from the Greek scar, and from the Latin obliterate. So I'm glad that our language is borderless and there's a lot of crossing. No wall. Temple you. What is mysterious about loss? Flush of arm pulled from a wilted sleeve. Summer's urine tang in winter leaves. 
Let John Keats light another fag, or Bronte refuse the doctor on her black sateen satay. For whatever part of you may be taken away, you said, is the scar, the place I will visit first with my mouth each time. As gold visits the thieved till, sun the obliterated sill, saying, thank you for leaving me, this you, this living still. Um, so as, as Alice said, the, there, you'll hear maybe a couple more of these temple poems. There are several of them threaded through the book. And I think uh, for me, that idea that you alter, you carry with you kind of is what is the impulse behind those temple poems. And as Alice said, a temple is a site of worship. Um, it also is the part of the body uh, of the skull that goes gray first, so um, aging is in there somewhere. Um, and then I also learned that Roger's thesaurus, the old one, the one that's sort of thematically based, begins with existence and ends with temple, which I thought is pretty cool. And then this summer I taught a group of Chinese students and they showed me the Mandarin uh, character for uh, poem, and it's a symbol that, two, two symbols, and it means word poet, word temple, rather, and I thought that that was wonderful, that a poem is a kind of word temple. Uh, orexia, um, the title, uh, does mean desire, and when I first conceived of this man manuscript and had a working title going for it, that was Anorectic's Book of Hours, so the, you know, it was sort of troping on the, the medieval books of hours, and occasions for prayer, and I saw a really beautiful book of ours at the museum, at the Johnson Museum this afternoon. Um, but my friend Charles Wright said, you know, that's, no, that's too, <laughs> too many words for that title. He said, why don't you just call it Orexia? So um, anyway, I, thank, I have thought Charles to thank for the title. I also learned from one of my children that Orexia is the name of a female lubricant, so you can enjoy that detail. Um, apparently, it's, uh, <laughs> If you, well, when you look it up, you'll see apparently there are some danger warnings about it, so don't use it. Uh, but anyway, um, I thought I'd read another temple poem. This is, uh, Alice mentioned this poem, Temple Gaudete. Gaudete means rejoice in Latin. And it has a little, I can't sing, but wish I could. But, um, but I think all poets want to be singers. And, um, there's an old, old hymn, that, uh, a carol, really, that, use, that has these lines, Deus homus factus est natura amarante, which God has become man to the wonderment of nature. Temple Gaudete. Is love the start of a journey back? If so, back where? And make it holy. Saint Cerulean warbler, livid blur, heart on the lamb, Courses arterial branches, combing up and down, embolic, while I inside punch down and fold a flow of dough to make it later rise. Recorded medieval voices, polyphonic, God has become man to the wonderment of nature. Simple to say, there is gash, then balm. Admit, we love the abyss our mouths sipping it in one another. At the feeder now, back to the cherry, quick, song's burden, rejoice, rejoice. Oh, salve and knife, too simple to say we begin as mouths, angry swack, lungs flooded with a blue foreseeing, story that can save us only through the body. I, um, I read this poem um, at, uh, at my church, at a service at the winter solstice that's for people who don't like the holidays and feel very depressed about them and so forth. And my um, youngest daughter, who went to the University of Chicago, uh, was at Chicago at the time, and she came in the, she was picking up a friend at the train station for the holidays, and they came in the back of the church just as I was reading this poem. and. Um, and my daughter's friend said, how is that poem not about sex? And, um, and that it remembered, I, re, I was reminded that my, when I read at Chicago, my daughter, uh, well, anyway, she followed me 
as I was going into the auditorium, and she said, Mom, and she took me aside, and she said, please don't read any of those middle-aged sex poems. Um, so I, um, I'm not going to read any of those, I don't think, but, um, or late middle-aged sex poems, as I should say. But um, anyway, what I told Susanna was that they're not sex poems, they're religious poems. Um, and for me, the beloved with a big B and the beloved with a small B are the discourse I use to write about both are probably kind of interchangeable. As your, as your guy, Ammon, said, touch the universe anywhere, you touch it everywhere. Um, here's a poem that is an elegy for my uh, friend, the poet Claudia Emerson, who died two years ago um, in December. And um, I was, the, this was, it was December, and this was maybe February after she died, and I was in, walking my dog in the yard, and that's the time of year in Virginia anyway when the snow, snowdrops come up. I don't know when they come up in Ithaca, but they're beautiful, you know, little white flowers, and they, they're very stalwart, and they come up through the snow, and they can be snowed upon and snowed upon again, and they still look beautiful. So this poem is sort of addressed to Claudia, um, and the snowdrops sort of stand in for her. The, it begins with a kind of a description of the snowdrops. Isom, still inhabit, full drooped and greeny, as you were, first shouldering weeks ago, the very night winter pinched, sodden, dropped its overcoat, sooty chillblains, chins of snow, and yet this morning, just shy of equinox, in wake of melting, you, pagan, drunk on sky's milk, find me. Temptation of sadness, bracked scape, dilator of death's fisted rooms, you sing your blue, your worried note, as though you suffered for me, kneeling in pine snuff, in brackish cord of your light, incurable. Um, so, uh, some of, I'm so glad some of my former students are here, and Alex will remember my coming to the soccer game with my little girl, and now she's the one who, anyway, she, I mention her in this poem, after your kids grow up and leave the house, um, then sometimes, uh, like, I, try, I haven't turned any of their rooms into a gym or anything like that. But I try to keep, but every now and then we have a guest come and I have to kind of go in and clear, clear out things. And so I was in this particular daughter's room and, um, and I found this uh, thong. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not very big. And uh, I'm not, just reminded, so the, there's that in the poem. It's about other things. It's really about the empty nest, but that's a moment in the poem reminded me of finding the vodka bottle in the closet in high school. Um, but anyway, um, this poem is called Mystic Toys. Um, it does mention some dolls, some dolls that were put in a box and put out on the curb. I didn't do that. Um, that was done to me by my parents. They, while we went to school, they took our toys and put them out for the junk man. But, you know, it's a poem, so I just I appropriated it for my poem. And I think that's all you need to know. It's raining a lot in this poem, so that if you can just picture um, a mother going through her daughter's room while it's raining outside. Mystic toys. Balconies of green, unrefrained rain, steaming ungirdled in culverts, whelming gutters, spouts, sun and amnesiac, erased imprimatur, and what rains in this house is the musk of abandoned warrens, ammoniac carpet spores, dank closets, emitting sweet scarlatina, hem, towel, infant receiving blanket, the absence of fat dude cheeks, foreheads mouthed with wishes. None of them is here. Enchanted bodies, hefted, fed, sponged, sung to sleep in a museum of dolls, eyes would fail to close later on their backs in boxes beside the curb, and looming creatures rubbed to fever sheen, rooms made wavery by slaked windows, silvering a shoe left behind, stiletto, faux leopard with turquoise sole, 
and this remnant thong, unlikely fret, amethyst, spider floss, hardly daughterly, and yet stooping, water recalls palatial ice, the larger space it took, the weight impossible it held. Um, I thought I would read this poem, the, one, of the poem one of the John Clare poems. Um, a, for a few times, I've been invited to the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, Vermont, which, and one year to, to read and meet with students there and everything, and it was one year I got to go in May, which is kind of like coming to Ithaca at the end of April. Um, I'd already gone through spring in Virginia, and then I went north, and I got to do it again, which was really beautiful. And um, so while I was on this um, trip, I was reading, a, reading John Clare's poetry and reading about him. And I don't want to, most of you probably know who he is, but he was, he's one of the, people think we're all insane, right? Hello, Zelaznik's, you know, we're all, poets are all, you know, crazy. Um, but he really was, you know, he was somebody who <laughs> thought that he was, he was a beautiful poet too, but he, you know, he was in, um, in several asylums for a while, he thought he was Shakespeare. He thought he was Lord Byron. Uh, he he had two. He thought he had two wives. One of whom he thought was still alive. And really, I recommend to you, if you haven't read it, this beautiful piece of prose that he writes about this walk that he takes from a an asylum outside of London all the way almost to Scotland. And he does it with no food and on foot. And he's really in a fugue state. And it's the most ecstatic, it's just a beautiful, ecstatic piece of writing. Um, so this poem is called Reading John Clare, Heading North. Going alone with song for company, homeless at home, homeless at home. Though sometimes time drops from the shoulders into hedges with low darting creeps, escape ways. And who are we then? Skirting the labor in vain public house, eating grass to humor hunger, getting up as famished as you lay down. O oh, gypsy, pilgrim in fugue state, on the lamb from lunacy, trekking a long way only to be locked away again after years of poetical prosing. Gravel in the shoes recalls the body to every soul chasing ignis fatuous friar's lantern. I'll bend down for a dime, St. Charles Wright said. I won't for a penny, but I will for a dime. In truth, I'm traveling not on foot, but by air, minute crosshairs sketching the coast's asphalt amalgam below, then opening lowering over green loping switchbacks capped with ice. How large a shadow wings must make, caping small things hidden in another story. A second spring here, swords and flush, long purples, blue bottles, peepers cronking, a red mill shouldering the river, its small crescent of rapids, rush and throstle. I am in a madhouse and quite forget your name and who you are, wrote Claire. But also, I can be miserably happy in any situation, in any place. As he was, watching starnels swarm at dusk, waiting for death to bring the bill. Same day, another bed, we're never beyond the right of seizure. The moon, a flipped coin winking in the water's scrawl, marked with our names, though not a word spoken, riding the sweet black tongue to the falls. Um, the next poem, I, what I thought I would do is read a few more poems from Orexia, then a couple of new poems I've been working on, and then I'll come back and read one more poem from Orexia. Um, so this is a poem that imagines a scene um, it's a temple poem also, imagines a, a scene from John chapter 20, um, verses 11 through 18. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, it's just, um, it's a moment after um, the, when Mary Magdalene goes to um, visit the tomb and it's empty and uh, then she um, sees someone she thinks is the gardener and it turns out to, to be Christ. Temple tomb. And the speaker is, the, is Magdalene. 
In this marrow season, trunks tarnished, paused, I am garden, am before, asleep. Then the changes, placental, murd, wet hem when you appeared. What did your body ever have to do with me? In my astonished mouth, in skulled jawbone, guessed, though as yet I didn't know you. You sprung, you now in transitive, tense with heaven. Gardener, which of us said, do not touch? Which one of us was undressed? I thought, because of Unami, I thought I might read a poem about our morel patch. Uh, we have a little, an, a dying ash tree in the backyard, and um, morels like to grow at the foot of these dying ash trees, and they're, you know, they're, mushrooms are tricky, and uh, you have to really, there are these faux morels, and so you have to really know what you're getting, because you die <laughs> if you eat the others. Um, but if you get the right ones, they're pretty amazing. Um, and I wrote this poem for my son, the chef, who, who has used these <laughs> unbeknownst to his, um, the people in his restaurant. Um, <laughs> Morel patch. And there's a lot of, you know, as you can tell, there are a lot of words in these poems that you might not know. Um, to Toulouse, a particular kind of headdress, a kiosk. There's one of those words. Um, but it's okay, I think, just to let it wash over. Morel patch. Ghetto miraculous, tipsy monastery, mysterious, embroidery erupting rashly in thatch behind the dying ash, gnomic roofs of steep snows, bee skeps on hollow stems, blown honeycombed tutelus with whiff of kiosk, cloister, old world sideshow, trousered intimacy, glass blowers, or the throat swollen in filigree by a swallowed key or B, intoxication, bell whose knell or tonic only time can tell. So um, we have a deer problemo in Charlottesville. I don't know if you guys have that it, it here, but the once in the not that long ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we'd put out salt licks like to attract deer because we thought they were enchanting and poetic, and now I have a herd of eight that live in my yard, and um, I've really tried everything I can think of from spreading that stuff out that smell, you know, why grow roses if they're going to smell like dog do, or um, there's another stuff that comes in, you shake it, and my, the chef said, you know, that smells all disturbingly like ramen noodle mix, <laughs> um, and then also cut hair, urine, whatever. Um, nothing seems to work. They'll eat anything, as we know. So. My father, who uh, my, is a, been a widow, my mother died a couple of, a couple of years ago, um, is a big gardener. He was a chemist for Merck, and then when he retired, started making beer and growing grapes and had a little, or has a little orchard and a garden. And he also has problems with the deer and can't think of, he can't keep them. It's like a narcotic, the tomatoes, you know, even though, anyway. So I was also reading uh, Thoreau's Walden and I was reading his bean chapter. Uh, and you know, he, he gets mocked by his neighbors for um, growing miles worth of beans that he can't ever eat. And he also can't keep up with the weeding and stuff because as he's, it's groundhogs for him, not, not deer. But anyway, um, so this is a, about my dad, but it, you'll see Henry uh, David Thoreau in here as well and some of his language is in this poem. My father's dream of Thoreau, and there's the epigraph, what shall I learn of beans or beans of me? And the he in the poem is my, my, my father. He doesn't know it, but he's in the long row with Thoreau, decades behind him, boyish soul in an old body bent over an ancient tool, Johnson grass and crab already whispering, fool, fool, claiming impatient the mile he's just hoed, craven moon above glistered as the needle's eye, his dead wife mouths, whiskery tail of thread, Lindsay Woolsey stitching of bean plants, moth eaten by deer, that step behind him, soundless, this time a doe and two new fawns in voracious flow, tracks labial 
in the fresh chop. Why do it then, so much more than he can ever salvage, eat, or share, well past 80, though the holes he makes in cindered din are not for himself to lie down in? A catch of rain hums farewell in a notched gauge. Netted by stars, wasp-gouged pears drop surreptitious, a visitor's footfall coming from the orchard, whether he's ready or not. How then can our harvest fail, Henry calls back to him, cheery hail in the 19th century voice of his father's father, also a farmer, when a furrow has never cared one whit for its husband. Um, another dad, another father poem. Um, so I mentioned that he was a scientist, and uh, I don't know what you think of the tra transmigration of souls, but, you know, um, so about a week after my mother died, um, and we live inland in Virginia, this uh, seagull, my father was on a roundabout uh, near his house, going, to, uh, and this big seagull comes down and starts, like, beating on his windshield. <laughs> And he, was, he started telling me about it, you know, as, as though, you know, and then uh, I solved for X, you know, and I'm like, hmm, D so dad, do you think there's anything unusual about seeing a seagull and mom's just dead a few days? And, and he's like, mm, you know, and I thought, you know, it's mom, you know, I, I couldn't get him to see. So this is, um, this is called reading an old book. And, the, and the, really the thing about old books is, is that they all, if you, many of you work with them and they, they give off a smell. Uh, that smells a lot like vanilla and almonds. It's a chemical that causes that, and you'll hear some chemical names in here. I thought that was fitting for the chemist. Um, and then also an old, you know, uh, I'm, the trope is the flapping book is a little bit like a seagull. So reading an old book. Inside is a yoked tulip clad with snow, toluene, benzaldehyde, almond sleet, vanillin, a ragged span, like the seagull blown inland by dented storm. My father a widower one week, stalled by its bluster, blizzard pages repelling toward the windshield and back, something leaking through the traffic, the roundabout, his scientists doubt, deciphering now a W, now an M, then away in mackled breakdown of sky, lignin, he might say, releasing chemicals, nostalgia. No, admit it, the neural mesh of being, the yielding vehicle that lets him go. I think I'll read just one more from here, then read a couple of new poems, and then I'll come back and read one more. So in this poem, um, I've mentioned my son, the chef, and I have these two daughters, and um, I don't know, is Cecilia's sister here? Just asking. No, one of my daughter's friends, so I, I might not read it if she were. <laughs> anyway, um, Cecilia has this wonderful family, lives upstate, and they, uh, my daughters were going to a New Year's Eve party at their house, and they were uh, doing a, planning a mashup of Adele's, hello, you know, and Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights. And I don't know how many people listen to Kate Bush anymore, but if, you know, a, a key line from the Kate Bush song, and she's sort of the, an ancestor, I would say, of, of Joanna Newsom, just to give you an idea of her voice and everything, her performance. Um, and so the key line is, hello, Heathcliff, it's me, it's Kathy. You know, okay, so there's two kinds of hellos going on. And one is Adele's very dusky, sexy, grounded hello. And then the other is this really crazy, shrill, wonderful, Kate Bush, hello. So those are the two, that's the thing to think about, I guess, the, the background of this. I told you I couldn't sing, but uh, I'm going to anyway in this setting, a little bit. Duet. Two sisters, side by side, benched at the gleaming fin of the living room's out-of-tune baby grand, work out a mashup, Adele's hello, and Kate Bush's Wuthering Heights. Hello, it's me. Heathcliff, it's me, it's Kathy. Voices by turns treble, then cemetery dusked, meandering and hungry as the sinew tracks of moles sponging December's yard, painted mouths of iced puddles, branchless leaves snaring the window with inhuman gale. One daughter swallows this heavy beauty, rolls the mordant perfume back to bloom, 
as the other slips out of autumn's whalebone stave, descant. They sing as if still girls, as if before love's scarlet evidence, and not like the year, the trees already moved, moved through. So um, one, after, um, I mentioned today when I spoke with the MFA students that I have been sort of afraid to read this book or to look inside it. This is actually my sort of out, coming out with the book. Um, and I don't know why that is exactly, but um, I think it's something like the way that actors sometimes don't want to see a film that they've, um, they've been in. I, I, I think we, we're not sure what it adds up to. That was one great gift of Alice what Alice said. Um, but anyway, one of the things that's important to me when I'm putting a book to bed kind of is to be writing new stuff. And so I got invited by a friend um, to write a sonnet for a journal. And, it, and, um, and he's, you know, the, it was one of those obstructions, you know, the, the five obstructions. Like I had to write it in an hour, um, and I had to be on one of four themes. And so um, I, wrote, I did that, and I... Um, and I really liked it, liked doing it. So I, I just have kept doing it. So since about, I don't know, I have about 50 or so. Some of them are horrible. Um, but that's just what I've been working in. So I said something to my colleague, a colleague of mine about it. And I said, you know, I'm working in sonnets now. Isn't that funny? And she said, oh, no. She said, have you looked, in, or have you looked at Orexia? <laughs> no. Um, but she said, there are, you know, most of these are, are seven couplets on a page. You know, so in a way, you've really been, and there's a lot of rhyme and off rhyme, so in a way, she said, you've really kind of been moving toward this for a while. So anyway, um, as at least one of you, Lisa, wherever you are, insomnia, Lisa, no, I don't sleep well. And, um, and so it's ironic that I stay up every year to see the Perseid meteor shower, you know, and they never, I can never see them. They, I, I stay up all night and uh, I can never, they never fall for me. So anyway, so this is about, um, th this is called, oh, and so like the Temple and the Hour series, um, th these are called madrigals and, you know, madrigal is a song, um, a very um, intricate uh, song, usually tacit, you know, polyvocal, and the, I think the idea is that, you know, these are also very kind of intricate, like sonnets. Okay. Perseid Madrigal. We're always awake, but they never fall for us, nor allow us to see their stone iron, gassy spectra, and debris trails bruiting the dark as a cosmic x-ray of the deepest secrets. What still stands at the end of wonder? Is it our own demise in which Freud opines we put off and off believing? Why? Is it the way a wary child protects a parent, hiding all it really knows? And life just an expanse of field, a torched textual gloss, a humid summer foyer we expect to cross? Let's not know our last days as our last. And this is how you'll know me after I'm erased. In any place you are, I'll wear your face. Um, some of the, I, I, I really tried at first to um, sort of really be, keep, stay with the, you know, the pentameter and everything. So here's another one that tries to do that. And then I play with it a little bit more. This is called Gradual Madrigal. <laughs> a gradual is also a kind of anthem, but. Does God create desire so we'll loathe the aging body for its hold on us? Or does desire create God to hold all that wanting one another sows in us? Either way, wonder, let's go slow as we can, closing in while not forgetting the generous poor of time's bartender, the one with the heavy hand Forgotten, whose liquid sutures eventually dissolve, even the children we once were, like love held in dissolve, the disappearing decolletage of gravity-driven sand. Perhaps when love is greatest, we do die into whatever our bodies were, swamp, cell walls, travelers. And maybe I'll read a couple, just of these short, sort of more, uh, more playful ones. They, longing Madrigal. 
Yearnings as far as I can go with you gone. Its fruit is prior to body, a proof of soul. Your absent body's testimony, divinities got form. All afternoon, a naiad rain. I had a crave for oysters and all the world's fonts that hold your name. Signs to be swallowed whole and raw upon discovery, like a password or a battle plan. Now, this sickle moon, which only seems a part. And then I'll just read one of these other little short sonnets, and I'll read one last poem. Adolescence Madrigal. Lindens in a novel were what I wanted to be under, angsty and fey, beside the key I learned, the quay I learned to pronounce as key, as I knew to say yates, not yeats. The clatter of wheels I craved was just my heart, corseted ribs that only special hands might heal. Blame in the virulent jaundice of that autumn, brutal shiver to school on suburban sidewalks, lugging hunger privileged as a heavy book. I dreamed you even then above my breasts, undreamed of plot without an end. So thanks for, uh, I just sort of superstitious. I always feel like I should read something. In fact, I wrote this like the day before I came up here. I, it's just, a, it's just a magical thinking, like wearing your lucky socks on game day. Um, this is called Expectation Madrigal. With the same, with the old same ache, as though we'd never yet, or as if one minute swallowing the next, the next, the next, interminably, after mute but acute storm, the sky, wary spouse, comes out, unlouvered and wild with sorrow, a loom at dusk over earth's broken dishes. I vow to trust this secret blue, tunnel tugging, wrapping fists around the rope. Oh, well, whose sunken hug I always, I cannot always fathom, but whose weight, dram, I believe, draw up a word, a mouth, an omen. And then I'll just close with um, one of the temple poems. This one is called Temple on My Knees. And before I do, I just want to thank you again for coming in on such a beautiful day to be here. And I'm very, just really happy to be here. I'm grateful. Temple on My Knees. When this day returns to me, I will value your heart, long hurt in long division over mine. Mouth above mine too, say you love me. Truth never more meant, say you are angry. Words, words we net with our mouths. Soul is an old thirst, but not as first as the bodies, perhaps. Though on bad nights, its melancholy eats us out to a person. True, time is undigressing, Yet true is all we can be, rhyming you, rhyming me. Thank you. Q and A time. So we have a few minutes to do to take some questions for Lisa. Hi, thank you so much for your day. Thank you. Are you talking about the Mystic Toys poem? Yes. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think that's what I'm always um, struggling with. And actually, we, we talked about some grads, we can talk about it tomorrow with the undergrads too, but um, I'm, what, what seduces me, what draws me, what I'm, I'm a, suck for, I guess, is, um, is lyric language. 
and and um, and so the the challenge for me though is to is to find a way to, for the reader to come in to the poem so that it's not just this brocade damask textured surface and so I found that. Um, the occasion for that poem really was, you know, not much happens in a lyric poem, right? In all these poems, like a woman makes bread, so she's cleaning up her daughter's room, uh, you know, really not, you know, somebody's, there's a bird at, at the feeder. Um, and so uh, that, this is not the big stuff of life, but you, what you hope is that by looking sort of deeply into that one thing, that's what Rilke talked about, right? That, you know, if you look deeply into a thing, a thong, a thing, a thong, uh, uh, whatever, then it'll reveal something to you about childhood and loss and so forth. So um, the occasion for that poem there really was a, this torrential rain and the weeping that that sort of caused in me and then to think about changes of state. So as the speaker thinks about her life as being sort of contracted, she thinks about ice and water. And so she. To, I always feel like even if I... If I have a lot of lyric language, I need to make it work. It has to be there for a reason. So all that torrential rain at the beginning, I, it can't just be a bouquet that you throw into the poem. I mean, so at the end, I, I try to come around to it again to say, you know, what I'm feeling now is this melting in a way of what was once this bigger thing. The children were there, the dog was alive, the, you know, the, the dolls were awake. And so I don't know if that really answers your question, but I'm interested in poems that mix up um, different kinds of discourse and different kinds of um, level registers it keeps me interested. Um, and so for me, the ly lyric language alone, you really risk solipsism and like maybe making your reader feel outside of the poem, the campaign inscrutable of the interior, as Dickinson would say. But then, you know, I also like to write about, you know, my, the, the, I mean, I, I want to write about my life. And so, um, try to bring those two together in some kind of meaningful way. I hope that the lyric language isn't just there as adornment, that it's there to somehow create a, an experience for the reader. Um, but that's a really good question and something I think about a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I like the Kate Bush invitation, very good. Oh, thank, no, <laughs> thank you though. She, I love her, but yeah. Leads to the question, um, you mentioned Kate Bush as something like that moved you from that song from uh, Literary Heights. Yes. Uh, how do you feel about a poet winning the Nobel Prize? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm sorry, I rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, no, Dylan, yeah, yeah, no, no, I know. Why not, right? I, I mean, I know people really have strong feelings about this, but um, I, this morning it was funny because I was talking with some grad students about, um, I, the only other reading I've given from this book is I gave with my friend Charles Wright, who uh, has this deal with me where he'll open it for me which I said was sort of like having Dylan open for Tom Petty. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know there's a lot, a lot of, but song is song, right? And poetry, like, we talked this morning with fiction and poetry writing students about how the opposite of poetry is a prose. And that, um, you know, I, I, I we, today, Kate, uh, Joni Mitchell came up, Kate Bush came up. I mean, these, these singers are important to us. You know, and some are more poetic than others. I think that at his best, I think Dylan is, is a poet. I don't know how you feel about it, but I, and I, I, I've heard a lot of debate about it from my students. You know, and I know that he is involved in some kind of plagiarism. <laughs> you know, the old cliche about great poets borrowing, good yeah. poets borrowing, great poets stealing, attributed to many different people, Eliot, the Twain, and whatever. Um, so I was pretty excited about it. Anything else? Oh, yes. Um, thank you so much. You mentioned that you ended up liking the obstructions exercise with the sonnet, so I just wondered how, what happened, and have you tried that with your students? A lot, yeah. yeah. Just ask any of the students uh -huh. in the front row. Right, right. No, I'm a big fan of obstructions, and we talked about that today a little bit, the wonderful movie, The Five Obstructions, by Lars von Trier, and how he gets Jorgen Love to remake this really stylized, beautiful movie from the 60s, and every time he he wants to break them down and make it more human, but every time Left remakes a film with all those different obstructions, he keeps making a better film. It just gets, the animated one isn't this great, but, but the other versions are, are wonderful. And I think obstructions are wonderful because I think art loves humans and it gives you something to resist. You know, 
and um, you know, and we, and we do resist them. You know, sometimes I, I mess with some of those sonnets, and others I really try hard to. Um, you know, I am a competitor. It's hard to write until you figure it out, and then it becomes become very shiny. And so I, I just, you know, trying to balance the two, keep refreshing my practice. You know, I'm old. I'm old. I'm in my sixth decade, seventh decade. I don't, I don't want to say out of time. <laughs> I've been writing for a long time, and I think that, you know, I don't want to keep writing the same poem over and over again. I want to keep trying. Maybe I can't escape that, but um, I want to keep trying new approaches anyway. So um, I enjoy the expression of the sonnets, and they're, they're still interesting to me, so I'm just going to keep it with it for a while. Okay. Thank you again. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.